Hello, and welcome to the Inside AVs podcast for August the 19th, 2021. This is episode number 72. Today, we'll be talking about Tesla Artificial Intelligence Day, the Chevy Bolt EV recall fix fiasco, the Genesis GV60 making its d- design debut, and much, much more. I'm, I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EVs forum moderator and Inside EVs editor. Joining us today is the venerated Mr. Tom Malogny. Inside EV's editor and host of the YouTube channel, State of Charge. Uh, our special guest today is Nikki Gordon Bloomfield from Transport Evolved, a media company which, among other, th- other things, produces regular electric vehicle content and a weekly news show on YouTube. Uh, check it out and subscribe if you haven't already. As well, we have Clint Simone, director of video for Mortar1.com, and according to his Twitter bio, lover of the Volkswagen GTI and Taco <laughs> Bell. <laughs> He's uh, sitting in for Mr. Martin Lee this morning, uh, taking the controls. And of course, we have Kyle Connor from Outer Spec Studios. He also puts together preternatural videos for the Inside EV's YouTube channel. <laughs> okay, so before we get going, I'd like to, to ask that you please subscribe to this show. And if you're watching on YouTube, please hit that thumbs up button. And of course, you can ring that bell icon on Twitch or YouTube and be informed about any new videos that pop up on our channel. All right. So with that out of the way, welcome, everybody. Um, So let's start with what we've been driving this week. Uh, So Kyle, you have a Polestar 2. So you join us right now. You're joining us from a Tesla Model 3 and you're headed to a racetrack or something. Yeah, we're doing some combustion stuff with the new Nissan Z, but that's not for this podcast. We are going, uh, uh, I should say, we have in the driveway a whole bunch of EVs, uh, but most recently the Polestar 2. I picked it up yesterday and super pumped about this. You know, I I drove the Polestar 2, was lucky enough to be among the first to drive it over a year ago, and then never did anything with it. We never picked one up on loan. We never did any charging tests. We never did any range tests. So I called Polestar last week and I was like, I'm really sorry, but we have never done anything with this car. Do you have any here? And they're like, oh yeah, just come pick one up whenever. So here we are. Uh, We're going to be doing, of course, the full zero to 100% DC fast charging test, a maybe a range test, although this is the performance pack one. So I'm thinking we'll do more performance oriented stuff with it. Uh, Driving it up yesterday, I put about 80 miles on it or so, getting up to the house from Denver because we were at a, a little local uh, regional events for a lot of journalists in Colorado. It is just awesome. It's so cool. It gets a lot of attention. It's pretty quick. The interior materials are organic and nice and warm. Uh, This one has the optional $4,000 perforated Napa leather in this very nice tan color. It's the old man spec. The thing rocks. Uh, What really is holding me back from giving it the the stamp of approval right now is the efficiency and the charging stuff. Uh, These are two big question marks that we're going to be testing. And yeah, if the charging curve is good, this thing's going to be leaving with a pretty uh, healthy review. So uh, Nathan Green asks, is the post to the front wheel drive one? Hell no. That's a terrible decision, by the (laughs) way. Um, I, what, you know, let's just talk about the front wheel drive version. Yeah. Next year for model year 2022, Polestar is going to be going on uh, yeah, and updating their their vehicle. It's going to be interesting. On the all wheel drive variant, the drivetrain will remain the same, but they will be adding uh, the optional addition of a heat pump, which will reduce uh, some electrical draw on heating the cabin and the drivetrain in the winter time. So we'll expect to see a few percent increment, especially in cold weather. Of, of, of efficiency improvement. But they're also coming in with a base model Polestar 2, which is a two-wheel drive version. And nowhere in Polestar's press release does it say which axle this motor is attached to. And there's a reason they don't want to say it. It's because they put it on the wrong one. They put it on the front <laughs> axle. Now, a lot of people will tell you front wheel drives better in the snow. This is the argument I got a lot. In an EV, it's actually not because there's no massive combustion engine sitting over the front wheels. In fact, the rear motor probably only weighs a couple hundred pounds, but sorry for the sun there. The benefit of having front wheel drive in the snow in an EV is almost nullified. The 
rear wheel drives actually probably better because when you're accelerating the weight transfers to the rear tires pushing you down into the snow and going also it leaves for a more controllable experience in my opinion and it lets the front tires do what they're supposed to do which is turn the car so th this whole front wheel drive thing uh, makes no sense to me because if you've driven Kona electric, Nero electric, you just roast the front tires all day long and it's actually pretty dangerous. So this one's the all wheel drive performance maxed out spec. That's nice. So the, uh, the price Delta between the front wheel drive version and the all wheel drive version is just like $4,000 or something. I don't think we'll see many front wheel drive ones to right. be honest. So, so Maybe I mean, in hot climates. Right. So if you're like really on a budget, or you want the extra little bit of extra range, but even the all-wheel drive version, the 2022 version, it gets uh, I think 60 more miles of range. I don't know if that's due to tire size or whatever, but uh, yeah, you already have some benefit of extra range, and then the front-wheel drive version would give you a little bit more. But yeah, I think they're get... also probably going to do something with the wheel and tire combination, running it through the EPA cycles. We've seen so many times where you know the second model year of an electric vehicle the automaker runs it through the epa tests again on a different wheel tire combo we saw this with tycon for example going from what 203 miles in 4s to 230 miles i think uh, and that's just purely a wheel tire change so we'll see what ends up happening here all right hey so tom you had a surprise meeting with the hyundai ionic 5 yesterday <laughs> want to tell us about that a little bit I mean, I don't yeah. know, you, you weren't driving anything else, though, right? That's No, no, I wasn't driving anything else. I had the ID4 last week. I'm getting a bolt EUV in a few days. Um, but uh, so I haven't had anything in between. But I got the, an email from Hyundai like two days ago, basically, that said, hey, we're going to be in New York City uh, on um, on Thursday. Would you like to come and, and check out <laughs> the Ionic 5? And um of course you know um, i had a dentist appointment i had to cancel that so if my temporary filling falls out and i'm in pain i'm going to uh you know blame it on the fact that i tried to get this out there for everybody to see uh hopefully i'll get that rescheduled soon but uh in any event i was able to go to the city and uh i was the first one uh i, sh I showed up like two hours early because it was supposed to rain and they were kind of scheduling everybody to take a look at the vehicle in the afternoon. And I just showed up two hours before the event was even supposed to start. So I was there before the truck arrived with it. And I was able to shoot some video and do all my stuff before. And it worked out because the first scheduled meeting was with the Wall Street Journal. And as he pulled up and was starting to take some pictures, whatever, it started to rain. And I just left. So I was able to get in and out of there and get some video. I'll be putting that together and putting a video up on Inside EVs. Hopefully sometime this week, I just, I've got a lot of, of video already shot as Kyle knows in the can that you, you have to um, uh, edit and get out. But, uh, and speaking of which, for the last two weeks, we've had a lot of comments, people saying, Tom, when are you going to get the F-150 Lightning video up? <laughs> It'll be up Sunday on Inside EV's YouTube channel. So there you go. Just give me two more days and it's going to be up this Sunday. But getting back to the Ionic 5, um, it's so, I mean, I know people have said this before. But the, the, the proportions, it just like, it, 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 it's almost an illusion. When you look at it in the side of a picture, it looks like it's like a golf sized vehicle. And I think that's because th that's the basic shape. And plus, um, Hyundai really pushed the wheels out to the edge, all the way to the front of the vehicle and to the rear vehicle. So that's what they, you typically you do with these little hatchbacks to get as much interior room as you can. So the vehicle in pictures looks like it's it's not a very big vehicle it's bigger than an id4 you know which i just had for a week and it's hard for me to get my hands around that because the id4 is such a big spacious vehicle this is like an inch or so longer than an id4 so it's a big vehicle i i don't know if you put up yet i had a picture of it i pulled my my model three right behind it um and really because it has the uh, the the Whoa. this matte finish, this gray matte finish color. It's one of the options. I think it's called Shooting Star Matte, um, and it's almost exactly the same as the the satin um, gray wrap that I put on my Model Three. Um, you know, you can get that for the factory. You don't have to pay three grand for it like I did to to wrap my car. But it's a really cool color, uh, a finish, and as you can see, the size there. It's a little Excellent. deceiving because I took it from an angle closer okay. to the ID, the Ionic Five. Uh, but it's it's a big crossover you know this is this 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 has a lot of size 
This, Do you guys like remember the... when I was driving the blue Mach E from I think across the country, and I was in Vegas, and we pulled up next to a prototype Ionic Five, and the Ionic Five was bigger than the Mach E even. And this is it, Tom. You're absolutely right. This thing's huge. You, you don't expect it. And somebody just, David uh, asked, is it a model Y size? No, it's actually a little smaller than the Y. The Y is a couple inches longer, um, okay. but 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 it's um, it's a big, spacious vehicle. It's got more interior passenger volume than the ID4 or the Mustang Mach-E. And I would not have guessed that, uh, but, it, but it does. It probably doesn't have as much cargo space as the ID4. I haven't checked yeah. the stats, but just looking at it yesterday, it didn't look like when you open the hatch, it has as much room as the ID4. Now watch, I'll be proved wrong, but it just didn't appear to have uh, extra space. I mean, I love this retro styling, um, you know, with yeah. the pixels and the little tiny little squares and the lights. I mean, the Hyundai nailed it. And I fully was planning on getting an Ionic 5, 100%. I was locked in. I, I was ordering one, but when um, that Lightning, when the F-150 Lightning came out, I said, you know what, that's got <laughs> that's got to be my next EV, and that's what I put the deposit on, mm. and, uh, and, and I'm going to get because we don't really need a crossover right now, my wife and I, but um, I uh, seeing it yesterday, I was like, mm, did I make the wrong choice? That This vehicle is a really cool EV. It, th it checks all the boxes. Tons of space. It looks so futuristic yet retro at the same time, which that's so hard to pull off. Right. Um, so many things about it are cool. I got yeah. to, I've got to ask. Those uh, door handles are basically the same as the Model Three door handles. Did they let you have a sort of a bit of a play with the the mechanics of opening the door? So it, it's it's different in that uh, Nikki that it it presents when you approach the vehicle. The doors pop open mm -hmm. the model threes don't do that you know as, as you yeah, if course. you have the key on you and you walk up to the vehicle i have some video i didn't uh, upload that um for us to watch now though um as you as you approach it the the door handle opens up on an angle um so you know when it pulls you up so i, I didn't get the feel of that it was that similar to, to the model three at all because it looks because stylistically it presents, similar stylistically you're, it, yeah. it, it it is yeah um but uh i mean everything was really cool i i played around with the uh you, you, in order to use the uh, off the um, the vehicle to load uh, feature, you have to. They the Hyundai made this adapter. It's like a J seventeen seventy two connector on one end. So you plug it into the car, and then on the other end, it's a uh, you know a a, a a plug that you plug your extension cord into. So it's there's no you don't plug it directly like your extension cord directly into the vehicle. You have to plug it into the charge port. Uh, and I played around with that a little bit, but um, you know, it's it, it, it's an interesting thing. And I'm not, I didn't get clarity if that's included. I, I'm sure it's going to be an option to buy that thing. It's not going to come with the car. Uh, and but it only delivers here in the U.S. It only delivers 1.9 kilowatt. Uh, okay. in, in in Europe, it does uh, 3.6, but here it's only 1.9. So you're not going to be able to power a lot of stuff like that. It's not like the Lightning where you can power your home. The Lightning can can offload 9.6 kilowatts. This is just yeah. 1.9. But you could power a few things, and it'd be really cool camping. You'd be able to, you know, do a lot of stuff uh, if if they're tailgating things like that. I wonder why we get a smaller output than the Europe. That's not right. It's it's two forty volt electric versus one twenty. Yeah, they exactly. probably have an amperage limit, and then they're yeah. just at a higher nominal voltage. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Kyle. I'm sure someone will figure out a way of hacking it though, because you know, right. EV owners are very resourceful. That's true. I'm just going straight into a high voltage back. 800 volts. Let's rock. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that that that's so cool too. I mean, you know, 20 to 80 percent in what 15 minutes or 18 minutes. Oh, I can't um, wait to do the charging yeah. test because we know it can do it once. They've they've shown us the crazy speeds. Can it do it on a road trip over and over and over? Yeah. Is it going to overheat? Yeah. This is going to be interesting. Well, yeah. Kyle, you're the man to do the road trip testing on it. You know. <laughs> Hey, hey Clint, Florida to Colorado, like it did the ID4. <laughs> hey, hey, Clint, did you have anything electric this week? Good morning, everybody. I was I was admiring Kyle's dedication to the podcast by doing this from what looks like a Starbucks drive-through. Uh, I don't have some. Uh, actually, you went inside the drive-through. <laughs> Oh no! You walked inside the yeah, store. Yeah, yeah, I wasn't even. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm loading up on coffee right now, so I can get my energy out when we talk about the the GV60. Um, okay. But in terms of electric, I was at Monterey Car Week, and I Ooh. admittedly, 
had a lot of gas car experience, but I did get inside of two uh, EVs that I'm now particularly excited about. One is the Lucid, which I'm sure you guys have talked about that car ad nauseum, but it was my first time to sort of poke around the interior. And um, it's a long time coming, but based off what they're telling us, we should be driving it in the next couple of months. Uh, the Lucid representative was actually talking about how excited they were for Tom to get inside of it. And, you oh. know, that makes sense. Big deal. <laughs> um, Clint, let me interrupt one second. I have to yeah. add this. Yesterday, Hyundai had the car parked in front of the Lucid Studios. <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Well, so I won't say in front. I'll say about 30 feet to the left of it. But right. you could. I, one of the videos, I'm like on the Ionic 5, and then I just zoom pan up. And it says yeah. Lucid Studio. So Lucid's trying to put funny. those studios on every major block, I swear. But anyway, getting inside of the Lucid finally, I'm still just excited to drive it as I was the last couple of times I said we couldn't drive it yet because it's not ready. Uh, and the other took me by surprise, the BMW iX. Uh, really? From outside, that thing is heinous to look at. However... On the inside, they've done some really cool stuff to that car. I don't know if any of you have kind of seen photos of it and what it looks like. And I'm sorry, Dom, I didn't send you pictures ahead of time. It's it's chunky. The Um, the inside of it, they really stepped up their game and they took out new materials. Basically, like case in point, they made it different than any other BMW that's on the road right now. And they're a company that likes to fall into the same trap and do a very similar interior across all their cars. So iX... I think is really neat and, you know, sort of in line with the Ionic 5. It's way bigger than you think in pictures. That thing they said is about the same interior space as a BMW X5, the the SUV that you're all familiar with. So I think we're driving iX. We'll have a first drive on Motor One and Inside EVs in about two or three weeks. We'll get our first taste of it. Um, but that'll be something that I'll be excited. Yeah. Oof. Don't show that it picture. Is ugly. It There's is a ugly, reason but... I talked about the interior. I'll say that. Mm. Look, let if we took away that kidney grill, right? It would look eminently better, instantly better. And we could say that about a lot of BMWs here. I that's mean, the but... money shot right there, though. That that's cool. Yeah, it's very futuristic. Person. There's all sorts of crazy materials. I have no clue if you're able to zoom in on the seat controls at all with your mouse. But even the seat controls, the car that we got into was a burgundy interior, and they were gold. They were sparkly gold seat controls, and in this case, I believe they're like a crystal silver. What the hell? I mean, they're taking all sorts of, there you go. They're taking all sorts of chances and just like jazzing this thing up for really no apparent reason. But I love that as they're switching over to building more electric vehicles, that they're taking some more chances. I think especially with a German car company, anything to shake them out of their comfort zone is kind of a cool thing. So I've got a theory here yeah. about those interiors, and that is that they're trying to make the cars feel like their price tag. Um Obviously, your run-of-the-mill BMWs are expensive. They sit towards the higher end of the premium of the everyday premium as mm-hmm. opposed to the oh i don't have to ask how much this car costs because i know i can afford it and i've got you know three billion in the bank and i think that that one of the criticisms of past bmws past electric bmws is that they were they were quirky but not necessarily they didn't necessarily feel like a bmw a traditional bmw maybe they felt more like a mini in the way that they they were designed. Yeah. I like the design of the i3, but they I wouldn't have classed the interior of the i3 as necessarily being BMW premium. And I suspect that BMW is worried about the, the EQS. I suspect it's worried about potentially the Polestar. It's also probably a little bit worried about Plaid <laughs> and, and what Tesla's doing, even though Tesla is far more minimal. And I suspect that that this new the new premium is recyclability the new premium is ethical interiors the new premium you know it's not cowhide anymore it's it's how many recycled and and um sustainable materials can we put inside this vehicle and then charge a lot of money for it you only have to look at the inside of the air right the i've sat inside the the beta prototype of the air i was i you know took it for a ride and the inside of that car is very well appointed and I can see the IX looking towards the lucid air in terms of, of that interior premium content. 
And both that BMW and the Lucid, we were inside of them and both cars that I was in uh, had leather. You could have full actual leather from a cow if you wanted it, which is funny because I'm like you. I think they're nailing these sort of vegan interiors that still feel very nice and are just as good at the real thing, if not better. But in both cases, the the BMW rep was like, nope, that's that's from a cow, what you're sitting on. So, Which is ridiculous if you think about it, because if somebody asked you to name the interior of an EV that feels very conventional and normal, Right. I would now say the Mustang Mark E's interior feels fairly conventional and normal. Or but the Bolt. unless yeah. I am unless I am wrong, you cannot get a leather interior in the Mark E. It's all vegan. Yeah, for what feels like another rise very similar to a Ford vehicle. I, I believe you're right. But uh yeah, I don't know what I'll be driving that's electric in the coming weeks, but I'll say like that was my my two favorite exposures to EVs that I hadn't previously been in this past weekend. Some exciting how, stuff coming up. I'll say that. How was the Pininfarina Batista to look at? Uh, expensive. And I, <laughs> I think it'll, you know. I mean, I mean I, can you compare it to the Navarra, which was also there, the Rimats Navarra? I, I would rather have the Rimats oh. after seeing that thing in so many videos at this point. I guess it's a different conversation it's, for it's another the same day. Car, but, basically, so it's the same performance. Yeah. yeah. I think, uh, EV hypercars are going to have a very, very steep hill in terms of paying two and a half million. You know, right. we're all excited about EVs that are 50,000 and below that are going to take over the world. But right. EV hypercars, I think the Lotus Avaya is going to have a similarly uh, tough uphill battle. Uh, the performance is there, but I think those customers want a little bit more emotion in their cars, perhaps. And that's kind of the gist that I was getting in seeing that car in person. Yeah, we, we talked about that a little bit last week because the Remats uh, Navara had 150 production slots and they hadn't quite filled them all yet. Which yeah. Is like, you know, and then but the uh, Pininfarina Batista also has 150 slots. I don't know what's going on with her, their sales yet. And we're still at the point where Lamborghini can scrape the Aventador badge off of a car, put on the word Countach, and they'll sell out 112 of them in a day. And, so, uh, how you know. Much was that? Was that also around the uh, same? They money? wouldn't say, but it's it's at least two million from okay. so speculation. It's in that same ballpark, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It'll so, get there, but we yeah. got to give it some time. And personally, if I'm going to spend two million dollars on the car, I want all the drama, all the noise, all the flames coming yeah. out of the exhaust. And the EV doesn't add to any sort of dramatic experience in a hypercar. If you want numbers, buy a Plaid. Yeah. I don't know. I we have to. I'd have to drive the because I'm I'm really excited about the Navara, the uh, four wheels torque steer or torque uh, vector, vectoring. So I don't know if how, I mean I just suspect it's going to be kind of feel like magic when you're driving it. And to Kyle's know, point, though, I mean, if all you want is absolutely nasty acceleration, you can still buy that Tesla for for sure less than two hundred thousand oh yeah. oh yeah. and save oh. yourself quite a bit. If right. all you want is the acceleration, but that's right. a different conversation. Yep. It's an interesting one. All right. So, Nikki, you Yeah. Uh, so, welcome to uh, the Inside EVs podcast. For <laughs> like, so, like a long time ago, Nikki has a pod, or had a podcast, and I think it's the, coming the back The OG as well. show. Yeah. yeah. The OG Transport Evolved. Transport Evolved podcast. Yeah. And, uh, you know, she was crazy enough to put me on there a couple of times, which <laughs> gave me, like, so when, when the idea was floated in, you know, in our chat, you know, uh, we're, we're looking for a volunteer for the Inside EVs podcast. Uh, I mean that experience kind of gave me the the, uh, the naive confidence to <laughs> raise my hand. Do you so, know? It's, so it's, it's her incredible. fault that I'm here, y'all. Oh, uh, well, it's incredible to see how things have changed, right? So we're using a an online streaming platform to do all this. It's all happening in the cloud. Um, Transport Evolve, the original <laughs> podcast, started in 2009. So right. that's what 12 years ago now. Yeah. And we had, um, I had basically stacks of computers at my house in the UK. This is back when I still lived in the UK. And I had a mixing desk off camera and I had to feed everybody a separate audio feed. And then I had a video switcher with another hand that was doing all of the video switching. And this is really nice because I just have to be here. I don't have to do all of the switching. It is. It's, it's really nice. I've got to say, I'm a little bit jealous of everybody this week, you know, getting getting time behind the wheel. The one thing that we struggle here on the West Coast is getting press cars. Yeah, They always yeah. go east before they come west. Like, Polestar 2 hasn't come yet. The 
Volvo, uh, I was talking to a Volvo rep recently and a lot of the press fleet hasn't come over here. I don't think uh, GM has sent anything over West yet either. So just trying to get hold of cars. We're always six months to a year after <laughs> after the East Coast. Well, what market are you in? Are you in LA or whereabouts? Portland, I'm in the Pacific Portland? Northwest. So. Oh, well, that's, that's your answer. Why. Yeah, that's why. That's why. Clint and I are like, we can, I have yeah. to go to LA like three times a month just to get cars. No, no. We are, I mean, we are too far. We are too far north. Yeah, I'm in Tallahassee, Florida, so I, I feel your pain. I don't. I, there's nothing coming this yeah, way. You're pulling out of the Jacksonville fleet, Dom. There's nothing. You got to go to Miami, Nikki. You got to go to LA. Hey, Tom's the only one who doesn't have to go anywhere. And Clint, you guys live in the in the perfect fleet world. Yeah. Well, the problem, yeah, the good thing is when they deliver cars to me, I get to drive them for a while. That's great. But the negative thing is when they do press drives in. New, they're always in New York City. And that's nowhere to do a uh, press drive. It's like right. drive around in, in, in 20 mile an hour idea, yeah. traffic for 45 minutes. You get no feel for the car. Unless you, know, you I want remember to when the out ID4 the sound deadening. first launched, that's it, the press drive was in New York City. It was like, okay, driving up and down the, the you know, you know, 42nd Street, you know, it was like, yeah, uh, you could get good pictures, but you don't get a feel for the car. But luckily, but we do get them delivered to us, and I do get to drive. And I live in a really rural part of New Jersey, so I could, I could really get good, good feel for the vehicles out here. Nikki, I will have Tom drive an Ionic Five in the back of a box truck to your front door, <laughs> just so you can get some exposure to it. You know, it's really funny. I think it was the Ionic Five launch in in New York City where they had it out and they had all the billboards and everything did anybody else catch the completely unexpected un unplanned gate <laughs> crash of that reveal event by Akimoto oh that's right right <laughs> Akimoto has a billboard in Times Square or at least it did because yeah. obviously it's on the mark it's on the stock market and being an Oregonian firm, I'm very familiar with the, the CEO of the, of the company. I've been down there a couple of times and, you know, spent some time on the FUV. I personally love the FUV. If I had 20 grand sitting in a bank account somewhere, I'd buy one. Um, but they, they, there was this billboard ad playing for the FUV in the official B-roll provided to journalists by Hyundai for the Ionic 5. And it just made me smile. <laughs> Oh, we have a that is pretty a... hilarious. I like that spot. That's a good story. I just uh, speaking of argument, I just finished up a road trip on one, which took forever uh, because it only has a three kilowatt onboard charger. And you know, it's bad when like a two hundred twenty mile or three hundred mile trip is a road trip. But it took a couple of days. We had a blast, and it was really fun. And uh, yeah, it's an interesting machine for sure. That was a good video. I enjoyed that one. Hey, yeah. So, so Nikki. Uh, yes. So, so you are the, the formerly proud owner of a pair of <laughs> Sh Sh Chevy Bolt totally EVs. <laughs> yep. Uh, so I, I saved you in the, for last in the what did we drive because uh, those cars are one of our top topics today. Uh, right. So last month, GM announced a new Chevy Bolt EV recall after multiple fires in cars that had gone through the original recall fix. We learned that it was going to cost them $800 million to fix the 2017, 2019 Bolt EVs for, for their customers. And then this week we learned that they're, they will replace all the modules within the packs of the affected cars with new modules. Now you, you did a whole video on this just a few days ago and it's really right. good. If you haven't seen that people, uh, please go to Transport Evolved YouTube channel and check that out. Um, so you are not impressed by this fix and are instead going to go through another process. Yep. So Maybe tell us what's wrong with this module replacement uh, situation and what path you've decided to go down instead. So, look, this started off, I think there's a couple of things we need to put on the table before we go, go into that. First of all, all cars catch fire or have the potential to catch fire would probably be a better way of putting it. So every car yeah. that is produced has the potential to catch fire. BMW did a massive recall a couple of years ago. There's something wrong with the fuel injectors. I can't remember which which engines it was on, but it was one of their more popular engines. There was a problem with the fuel injectors, which meant that fuel could leak onto a hot exhaust manifold right. and cause problems. Um, we've obviously seen other EVs catch fire as well as internal combustion engine vehicles. But where GM has kind of failed here is its partnership with LG Energy. And I think LG Energy is the seat of all pretty much 
battery related EV problems right now. We know that Ford had issues with its LG Energy Supply battery pack. We know that Porsche had trouble with its LG Energy Supply battery pack. We know that the Kona EV caught fire and resulted in a massive battery recall campaign. And I think what what's happening with GM now, obviously, is it's it started off going, there's this issue and we can fix it in software. Then they said, uh, yeah, the, that software thing didn't work because cars kept catching fire. And then GM said, um, it's okay, we've, we've figured out how to identify the batteries and or we're going to figure out a way of identifying the batteries. We're going to be replacing affected modules. This week, GM has basically sort of tacitly admitted that it hasn't figured out a way to investigate the battery cells without ripping the modules apart to the point that they would no longer work to go, oh yeah, we made that one wrong. So I think the reason I'm frustrated with GM is not that it's replacing modules and not that it's coming to the thing that we all wanted in the first place. It's the fact that it's taken everybody round the houses to get there. As a customer of whatever, uh, whether it's a vehicle, a laptop, uh, you know, a, a new vacuum cleaner, I expect a problem a design flaw, a fundamental design flaw, which this battery pack problem is, to be dealt with um, with expedience and professionalism. And I don't feel that we've seen that from, from General Motors and Chevrolet to this point. Um, I'm not sure if GM's had its hands tied by LG Energy. We know that LG Energy has for many years acted like a an 800 pound gorilla in the EV space and thrown its weight around. I've heard some terrible tales about LG Energy basically playing off one company against another and saying, well, this company's gonna pay us more for batteries. So <laughs> pony up or you lose your you lose your allocation. And and I hope that LG kind of pays the consequences of that. But the reason why I'm frustrated with this battery recall is that it's the time. You know, this has taken nearly a year now. Um, battery fires started many, many months ago. I mean, it was late 2019 when we started to see the fires. Um, and uh, Electrek did a really good list of all of the different fires what we know the chronology of them there's more than 12 now um there's been fires in ukraine from exported uh, gray market bolts there's been ones in germany and europe in, in in the ampera e which was the bolts european cousin for a while and gm's known about this for so long that gm should have said originally don't drive your car we know there's a problem we're going to replace the packs that would have been like the 101 yeah but it didn't and it played everybody i think it put everybody's kind of usefulness for their cars into a restricted mode for a while i mean i drove a bolt ev from new york not new york from boston to portland so boston maine to portland oregon earlier this year we haven't put the video up about it yet it was a fantastic road trip the car was extremely reliable and we had a great time but had we been asked to drive that trip with the current restrictions that exist on all ball TVs, which is what effectively 130 miles range, so you, you can't taken go off too, 100 miles. You, you can't charge it too high and you can't let it go too low, right? Right. So you can't do, you can't go from 90% above 90%, which is going to take off 20, 30 miles. You can't go below an indicated 70 miles. So that's another. 70 miles. So right. you've lost 100 miles of range. So your 234-mile car now does 134 miles. Uh, now saying, I can't go to the beach and back. Right. I can't go to the Oregon coast and back. I live less than uh, 70 miles from the coast. Okay. I cannot drive to the coast and back on a single charge right now because of the because of the restrictions. I mean, I could, but then I'd be... <clears throat> risking if anything happened to my car gm turning around and going well you deep discharged your car right i i am pursuing a buyback um and an msrp swap so my partner's bolt was bought secondhand we bought that car because we were so impressed with mine um she can't she's not going to be able to use it for commuting to and from work really very usefully um 
her commute is only like 60, 50, 60 miles round trip. But if she then needs to run errands after work or she needs to take colleagues to, you know, run up to Seattle for a meeting or whatever, that's really dramatically going to affect what, what mm-hmm. her car can do. Right. And I've basically lost faith that the battery recall will be done in an expeditious fashion. And I'm not willing to wait for six right. months for GM to call me and say, bring your car in and we'll swap the modules out. I have every faith that the module replacement will work. But then again, this week, a 2020 Bolt TV caught fire. Right. So you, you have more faith than I do. Uh, so you mentioned on, on the show that you did that uh, uh, the Weaver Audio YouTube channel, which is has Professor John Kelly tearing yeah. down a, a Bolt pack. But he, he left a, a, a comment on your video just ex- kind of explaining the process a little bit of, of that module exchange. That's right. Uh, let me, if you don't mind, I'll read it real quick uh, because it's, it gives you some insight of, of what all these service departments across the country that do these Bolt module replacements are going to have to, you know, you have to have the confidence that their technicians are going to be able to do this, you know, perfectly. Uh, so you can, you know, drive through puddles and things. Mm-hmm. Um, so replacing the entire battery pack would be a far superior solution, battery section replacement. There are five battery sections with two modules per section, requires attention to detail, torquing all the bolts and nuts to specification, performing an internal battery cooling system leak check, performing a battery housing leak check, and many hours of labor. The battery cover has alone has 56 bolts and a two-step torque sequence. New battery warranty or not, there are many things that can be done incorrectly. So. Yep. And we're, we're hopefully, we, we're, we're, we're in conversations with Professor Kelly at the moment to try and do a bit of a collaboration oh, on our channel. Um, he, he's to- yeah, he's totally, he's totally right. Um, we heard from people who had one of the software updates applied non-applied to their cars so they'd taken their car in for the the fix update and the service center had tried to apply the wrong update hadn't actually carried out the proper update process but had marked it as being fixed and that person didn't find out until they checked the you know the version number of their car's software update and realized that it hadn't been done properly right the other thing is and i don't know tom if if this is a problem for you in uh, in new jersey um one of my colleagues, Winter, who used to live in um, on the in the East Coast, the Bolt dealership that he uh, was nearest to him that sold Bolts don't service Bolts. He couldn't find anybody on the East Coast that would even work on his car for a couple of days, and one dealership even said to him, "Yeah, you shouldn't bother, you, you you shouldn't get the update because if there's a problem with your battery pack, it's going to mean that your car is going to be out of action for a couple of days." Which and it is- <laughs> just blows yeah. my mind that that the service network are so out of touch with this. And, right. you know, let's not forget the economics of this make no sense whatsoever, because if you are building an electric vehicle on a mass production line and you can put the battery inside that car, you can put that car on a transporter and ship it anywhere. Literally, you don't need to have any special um special packaging there's no any there's no thermal requirements as long as the car is okay on the back of a transporter the battery pack is fine now let's look at shipping all of those modules all of those modules are going to have to be specially packed they're going to have to be crated up they're going to have to be electrically insulated they're going to have to be mechanically insulated they're going to have to be um, protected from any water ingress you're then going to have to load them onto a back of a, of a truck. You're going to have to distribute them to all of those dealerships that are going to work on it. That is a logistical nightmare and far more hard to achieve than just saying to the owners, OK, we're going to swap everyone's car out or we're just going to you know, bring your car in. We'll give you a good deal on a new car. We'll right. fix these cars, which is what obviously Volkswagen had to do with Dieselgate. Just think about how much logistical nightmare there was with with Dieselgate, right? With those uh, with those TDIs. So eight hundred million dollars the way they're doing it. I'm not sure. That's the. I don't know. It just sounds like this. What they're doing is going to be more expensive than like swapping out the whole pack or, or just buying back as many cars as they can. Right. right. So to to do a buyback, you need to call the Chevy Concierge hotline. Um, we have the number. We have a. a 
a thread on the Inside EVs forum uh, with that information. But you can also, you know, Google it. Google Chevy Concierge, uh, Chevy Bolt EV. Is there a special one for the Bolt EV? I believe. And so I guess you. What's the process? You just call them up and. Um, yeah, you you give them a call and you tell them, <laughs> you tell them what your what your uh, reaction is to it. In my case, I was like, look, I love my car. I love the Bolt is to my mind one of the best hot hatches you can buy. It is a true hot hatch. It's got plenty of torque. It's got plenty of power. It's front wheel drive. It goes like the proverbial off a shovel. It doesn't nanny you like a lot of EVs in the marketplace where you put your foot on the throttle. The throttle mapping is like, you've got a lot of torque here. Are you sure you want to go fast? (laughs) No, the Bolt's like, you want full power? Be my guest. And that's what I love about the car. It's it's not pretentious. It just works. And I, I told this all to the service agent. I went, but you've got me into a car or I am in one of your cars and you are not looking after my vehicle. You're not allowing me to drive it the way that you designed it. You're not allowing me to, to use it to its full potential. This is causing me lost time. This is causing me um, uh, basically problems driving uh so i would like a different solution i've i've lost faith in 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 the proposed software update please can we initiate a buyback and that's that's where we go okay let's talk about robots all right (laughs) so so yeah let's move it along uh so tesla held its i i ai artificial intelligence day last night and oh boy yeah it, it was for the most part super technical and difficult to follow uh, but some parts, especially where they discussed hardware, were, it was super impressive to me. Uh, perhaps for most of the big surprise and exciting part was the reveal of the Tesla bot, a humanoid human robot codenamed Optimus that they plan to have a prototype uh, sometime next year. Of. Uh, but we'll get to that in a sec. Uh, I think a little context uh, is in order first. So as you all know, Tesla vehicles have driver assistance software, autopilot and full self-driving. Uh, the company's goal is to use artificial intelligence to make the car eventually better than humans at driving. So this event was mainly targeted towards convincing people to join the company, the the AI team. So as they, as they said at one point near the end, the, the choke point for them isn't the hardware or the software. They've got that all worked out. It's people. So this was a, a recruiting event, essentially. Uh, but, but it wasn't help happening in, in a vacuum either. So just days ago, the National Highway Transport Traffic Safety Administration, uh, NHTSA, opened a probe that will look into 11 crashes where Tesla vehicles crashed at first responder scenes, sometimes into the back of fire trucks. Uh, these have resulted in 17 injuries and a fatality. Um, and there has also been speculation that the FTC may be looking into the company's terminology for its driver assistance systems as well um, because full self-driving is not actually full self-driving which could potentially lead to overconfidence in, in the vehicle's abilities um, so nikki uh, i know you've done some in-depth work with computers and and probably followed the technical as- aspects of the pre- presentation better than i did uh, like i said i was impressed with all the hardware design that i saw uh, looking at that and the software and the concept of using Dojo for training, the neural net. Do you have confidence that they can achieve safe autonomous driving anytime soon? <laughs> then we'll talk Look, about the robots. All right. So I have so many mixed feelings about last night. So okay. Elon Musk waiting 45 minutes after yes, the event was due to start was just not cool. Oh, um, especially for, for those course. of us. Well, no, but it, it, that was totally even is. less, especially long one though. Any other automaker, let's let's be honest here. If yeah. any other automaker had done that, we would all be crying foul. But because it's Elon, we kind of just expect it. And, and I think someone needs to tweak Elon's clock and just tell him, like, put him on. Be like, um, be like India. Move him half an hour forward of everybody else, and just tell him, <laughs> like it's it. We're going to be going at, at five o'clock, Elon. Oh, it's or, or we tell Elon it's going to be five thirty or six o'clock, and then he might be there on time. I think that would work. Um, so I think that Tesla has the ability to get, as do other automakers, to get the 
majority of autonomous driving roles sorted fairly quickly. It's that last 1% of those edge case use scenarios that it's going to struggle with. Elon said last night in the Q&A, there is a V4 hardware solution coming. We're going to see it in the Cybertruck. He said probably in about a year's time, which also indicates that we're going to not see the Cybertruck for another year. Nobody seemed to kind of I, twig I missed that. that part. I missed that part. Yeah. Um, the... Uh, the, the the software that we saw the the talking through the process it was very high level it was kind of university grade ai computer vision i only understood about 5% of it and you, you can follow the process so you follow the process okay. but you can't um learn. but it, and it was very clever, but it's nothing that I haven't heard from other people. I've I've been to NVIDIA events. I've been to Nissan events. I've been to other events where I've seen and heard their AI teams talk in a very similar way about their machine learning process and their labeling and their hybrid world and putting everything onto a vector space so that they can then properly identify and figure out where things are. Now, Tesla's uh, pipeline to my mind, feels a little bit more organized and more logical than some of the other companies' solutions I've seen. But what really blew my mind away last night was not the bot or the terrible dad dancing. It was the chip. Okay, that that the chip design. I don't have the right, eight and a half right. pages of notes that I, I took sitting on in another room. But the the D1 chip, which right. they've got, the incredible amount of processing power, and more importantly, the incredible amount of bandwidth on and off chip. We're talking about something that in those tiles, uh, the D1, the tiles of D1 chips can have 36. Um, so this is the D1 chip, right? Right. This one has teraflops of of um, of calculating calculating ability. Now, interestingly, the other thing I noticed is that. Tesla talked about the D1 chip and said, you know, 22.6 teraflops of floating point 32 bit calculations. But then in the later slide, it actually took off the floating point calculations um, at, at that level and, and switched to using a slightly different scale. But if you can uh, go forward a little bit, we actually talk about the, the actual. Um, so the, these are all the nodes working together. They're talking about the, the training tile, right? Which I think off the back of my memory had 36 terabytes per second bandwidth on and off tile. Yes. Which is just, yeah. I crazy. mean, yeah. Um, and then of course they're talking about the exapod. Um, and this, let's be honest, is Tesla's forte. The one thing that Tesla always does well is engineer small things to large scale. That is the thing that it really <laughs> exceeds at. What it's doing exactly the same thing here with what it's doing, what it did with its batteries in the very original Roadster. Everybody else is building massive batteries that they then shoehorned into a car. Tesla comes along and goes, we're going to use something that's what this big and we're going to put several thousand of them together and we're going to make sure that what we've got is a resilient, scalable, parallel battery system that if anything goes wrong, it will continue to work. And exactly this is what we're seeing with the training matrix and then this is what we're seeing with the Exapod. The Exapod has 1.1 exaflops of computing power per second which i mean look i if i was elon i might be tempted to put this mining dogecoin for a couple of weeks <laughs> before i actually you know turned it to do uh to do ai so that is really that is really the the and big and, thing and this is the first version they also have they're also already planning uh, another upscale hardware that's 10 times better than this 10 I, I mean this already blows my mind so it, I, I believe elon said this is has the uh human brain level uh capability now which is which is a crazy Ian brains are in, incredible i never i didn't think this they would be th this soon well, it also shows you how awesome the human brain is, right? Yeah. I mean, talking about how autopilot works, 
t- talking about teaching autopilot right. to go from just interpreting things frame by frame. What can I see in this picture? What is this thing? And what does that mean it's going to do to having a, a, a an awareness of what's just happened and where was I? What did I pass? What signs did I pass? What was the road conditions where I've just been? And what can I see around me? And what could I see a few seconds ago? So if there's cross traffic, I, right. I don't suddenly think that that car that's opposite me has disappeared. It's just still there. I can't see it. That contextual understanding of the world around it is incredible. Right. It just So I was really excited about the hardware designing. But everything else. But which? So which part were you were not so excited about? I mean, so but the, okay. So hardware <laughs> the wise. The, 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 oh yeah. Okay. Do we want to talk about? So, but uh, first of all, do, so did you get the? Uh, so, what kind of confidence level that do you have that Tesla will get to full self driving? In, in time soon, like next year. I think we're going to be waiting longer than that. I think it's going to be at least five years before we see anything approaching what Tesla wants to give us. Yeah. Okay. And in the meantime, get it off public roads at the risk of making some enemies here. Yeah. I would be, Nikki just put a a very like human level explanation of everything they talked about, which even I appreciate because it was above my understanding, but you know what? I'd be a lot more excited about all this technology if I knew it was in the safe hands of engineers in closed course environments where these cars are not crashing into things because it's obnoxious and it's wrong that they're putting these cars in the hands of the public and testing I it in think, that capacity. Well, I think legislators need to step in and start working with companies more. And I know that Capitol Hill is working with other automakers on trying to put in a framework. And I'm not sure if it's just that Tesla doesn't want to or if it wasn't. I think it is because Ford is doing it all. You know, all their Blue Cruise testing is done privately in the hands of engineers. So it's up to them. Tesla has the capacity to do it internally. And I don't think that we need to crowdsource this to make it any better. We are so, in a we are in an uncanny valley though because Tesla Autopilot is already in that uncanny valley of making you think that it's really really competent and it's good. The the statistics say that autopilot activation is safer than human drivers and that is exactly the thing that it's almost like like you read my mind there Dominic. Um the 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 number of accidents that we are seeing with cars that have autopilot is dramatically reduced compared to human drivers. Yeah, but Nikki, I, can we just talk about this for a second and, and sure. very quickly? Because look, we're on autopilot right now, just to show you. you know, here we are sitting on <laughs> autopilot, right? On the highway, we're like, when's the last time you've seen like a major highway accident? They happen, right. but not as frequently as like when you're driving in the city or in dense urban environments. So I think personally, like this slide's super misleading because most people, general population, only use autopilot on the highway, which generally is a safer place to travel than in urban inner city metro. Uh, look, I for I, I really don't want to comment too much on, on like the, the safety of autopilot. We can get into that in a whole nother episode. But personally, I uh, am with Clint on this one. I think, you know, Letting uh, you know normal people off the street test this very aggressive uh, new cutting yeah. edge beta software with little training uh, and little guidance from the company on what they should be doing, shouldn't be doing. Um, that's dangerous. I think you know trained safety drivers that go through courses that are uh-huh. you know held accountable oh. and responsible for the use. That yeah, that to yeah. me is good. In terms of the I- event, though, I, I mean that's that's off, off the topic. I just think this particular slide's a little misleading. I think that I think you're totally right. I would rather Tesla was not testing beta software in the wild. Um, and I think kind of just to to point, I, I totally agree with everything you just said. I think the other thing that we need to bear in mind is when people say Tesla is so far ahead of everybody else, what they're saying is we've seen Tesla say more about its autopilot and demonstrate more about its autopilot, but that doesn't mean that all these other companies aren't working in the background. I have a friend who works in AI, who works in in self-driving, and everything they've said to me off the record tells me that other automakers are also at this point. So I think... 
we are in kind yeah. of this 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 world of false equivalencies where everybody is assuming that because first to market means they are first to market <clears throat> that means they are best when other technologies are coming that i think are going to be as good as or if not equal or better to what tesla's currently offering and i think that is something that frustrates me insanely about the echo chamber that currently is the EV world. Right. Because um, I don't like, every time I've tried using uh, autopilot, I've been, I felt nervous because we've gone around, we've gone across a junction and the car's gone, oh, the lane markings have moved. Right, talk and on I've the steering wheel. I've friends who've got autopilot and they say the same thing. They've just learned when to safely use it and when not to safely use it. So your comments are totally, totally on point. To kind of wrap up this, I also think that that the way that Tesla has traditionally existed is to promote what it's working on far ahead of launch, which is not traditionally how a lot of automakers have done things. I, you know, if you, if Ford... I mean, I suppose Ford did it with the Lightning. But if Ford had come out and said, we're working on this massive, um, this massive, done a two-hour event talking about all the technology inside the Ford F-150 Lightning two years ago, we would all be criticizing it going, where is it? Where is Absolutely. it? Absolutely. Um, so let's make sure that we are kind of on that even playing field, which I think we all are, but I don't think the rest of the industry is. Right. So just to address the emergency vehicle thing. And so I'm, I'm still, uh, I don't know, I don't have enough experience with, uh, with autopilot myself to have a good feel, you know, how trusted, I know Tesla owners generally, it's what, like one of their favorite, you know, features. And I also know that like, if you Google, you know, accident, crash, fire truck, people run in the back of emergency vehicles you know, on their own all the time, it happens. It's a, it's a thing that happens. Mm -hmm. It should not happen on autopilot. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad it's, it should be investigated. Maybe they can figure out there's a technical issue. What that, the reason that happens and, you know, and also autopilot is getting better. So maybe it's less likely to happen. Oh, your picture really got a lot better there, Kyle. Um, so anyway, yeah. Hey, Dominic, so, hey, question for you. Can, can I interject for a second? Because uh, we've been talking about autopilot for a while and Clint's here and I know he wants to share some really important information about a jelly bean. So I'm looking forward to hearing about that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we're, 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 yeah, we're moving on from autopilot. So I just wanted to hit the robots. I took us down the rabbit hole. I apologize. But it's fascinating to see all the incredible things we saw last night. The people on that stage are absolutely brilliant. I just wish they would do the testing in their own brilliant hands. Right. So near the end of the talk of image processing, processing and labeling and hardware and software, they had a one more thing type moment. Uh, the screen on, on the screen popped the message, what's next for AI beyond our vehicle fleet? So what's next turns out to be humanoid robots. So <laughs> here we go, of, folks. Uh, here so we go. I'm sorry that 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 rivals the vault dance in the right. adult. The vault the dance, the that best thing ever. Happen, <laughs> ever. <laughs> so e e Elon starts talking and says, uh, "Tesla cars are semi-sentient robots on wheels uh, with these." So with the self-driving computer, the inference engine on the car, which will keep evolving. Dojo, the neural nets recognizing the world and how to navigate through the world. It makes sense to put all that on a humanoid form. So he mentions that they're also quite good at sensors and batteries and actuators, and that they'll have a prototype next year that looks like a mock-up that they had on stage. Um, so basically, it will be made to operate in a world designed for humans and do dangerous, repetitive, and boring tasks. <laughs> it's about five foot eight. Uh, weighs 125 pounds and has a top speed of 20 of, of five miles an hour no word on range or charge times unfortunately uh so the the reaction on twitter was mixed the tesla crowd was unsurprisingly enthusiastic <laughs> while there are lots of negative comments as well from you know just the twitterverse i personally like the idea because i've always wanted to live in a world with humanoid robots <laughs> you know uh, maybe i'm missing something clint how do you feel about these robots? Does it take Tesla <laughs> too far from automaking, or is it yeah like is it another revenue stream uh, in a wide open? It's a wide open niche. 
I mean, this. I don't think a, ever in my life have I heard the question, Clint. How do you feel about these robots? That was a great way to uh, to start the day. Uh, I don't know what I think about the robots. I think that again, this showcases that there's really smart people inside of that company, and I just hate to be the negative guy, but. As Nikki alluded to a little while ago, we saw Cybertruck years before it was anywhere close to ready. Right. And I think that this is a wonderful distraction from the fact that they're behind on a couple of their deadlines that they promised. And this is a great way to continue pumping up the valuation of this company. Clint just said something there. Let me interject. <laughs> My overall impression of what went on last night was it's great to get this information out there, but yeah. I, I thought misdirection. I just thought, okay, you know, Cyber trucks can be being pushed back even further. We can't deliver X's and 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 um and Model S's on time right now. There's some kind of you know really <clears throat> really production hell part two that's going on. And oh, but look what we're doing with the chips and 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 that's not all, folks. You know, you can get your own Tesla bot. You know, in a few years. So you know, while it was great to see what their roadmap is and what they're doing and and the 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 the, the chip stuff is fascinating. Um, I can't help. But see, when Tesla comes, does things like this, a lot of times, it seems like it always coincides with some kind of issues that they're having with delays and production problems. And it's like, forget about that stuff. Look at what we're look at what's coming down the road, you know. Uh, and uh, that that was just my general feel about this. And the comments coming right. in totally agree with you, yeah. Tom. You know, I mean, right. it's just typical Elon misdirection, and yeah. and he's great at it. You know, I mean, he's you know a master. You know, I mean, he's PT Barnum. You know, but and he's done yeah. a lot of great things. I don't, I don't hate Elon. You know, I mean, I, I own a Tesla. I've bought two of them. Uh, but you know, um, this, you know, it just seems like every couple of months we get, you know, uh, full self driving. You know, we're within, we're within four months of full self driving. You know, the cyber trucks coming and everything. Now it's robots are coming. Just keep right. Just keep kicking that can down the road. Yeah. And, and uh, I should you know, add the same caveat that Tom did. I root. For Tesla, I come down hard on them when they do things I don't like, like right. testing FSD on the road. But I'm rooting for them. That Model S came out years ago and made the entire industry catch up. And they still have the best infotainment and, and technology interaction out of any car on sale. Absolutely. I root for them, but I won't use a bad word. Robots, man, like, what are we doing? <laughs> what, like, come on. Um, yeah, I, I don't think we're going to see robots, you know, on our podcast. sorry, I was going to say Clint profanity is allowed on our podcast. Okay. Sure. Yeah. I'll try to, <laughs> I'll save that for the Genesis GV60. Yeah. There we go. Now we're talking. <laughs> So, yeah, I just want to say, so I don't expect to see, uh, you know, a, a robot for sale from Tesla, a functional robot for sale from, for Tesla in the next, I don't know, four years. So, but, and, but I do think that. The, it's more of a perception issue that you know he's doing this distractor and pumped it. Elon does not worry about the stock price. You know, to, I've been watching it for, since they went public in 2012. Oh, we lost Nikki. Uh, hopefully, she can get back. Um, but I, yeah, I think that's like one of the things he does not worry about. He does not worry about that, especially now. There's you know they have lots of money, they have lots of cash flow. It's not you know, but I do see you know how it can be perceived as a, a distraction or whatever, but. Yeah, but so let's see if we can do anything to get Nikki back here. He uh, sent her the she must link really again. hate the GB80. She, she has the link. The so thought of it yeah. made her leave. I, say, I think when we see her pop up back on the thing, we can just click on her again. Oh, there she there is. There we go. And I'm back. back. I'm Nikki sorry. took Thank vacation you. from all of our nonsense. <laughs> all right. So let's talk to Genesis. Um, Oof. So Genesis has finally unveiled the design of its first vehicle to sit on the eGMP platform. That platform, as our regular viewers know, is the same that sits under the very awesome looking Hyundai Ioniq 5 that we showed you earlier and the Kia EV6. The Genesis version is called the GV60. So Genesis is still holding back the technical and performance details but they did give us front, rear, and profile shots of the car, as well as a couple of the interior. Uh, I don't know if you can pull those up real quick. Yeah, Clint. Let me let me get on that real quick. Sure. So Genesis is still holding back the technical and performance performance details, but they did give us oh, right the, the front these Ugh. shots here. <laughs> <laughs> so, ah, uh, man. So. Yeah, we've heard a lot of different opinions about this design, uh, which they say is meant to capture 
athletic elegance, but I haven't heard yours, Nikki. So let's start with you. <laughs> it's it's got I don't know. It's like someone's taken all the bits of different cars and smushed them together. The back end reminds me a little bit of a Porsche. Um, then you've got that front right. end, which makes me think instantly of the Kia Soul. Me too. Um, and then the midsection. <laughs> the midsection <laughs> that, that, makes me think. Uh, <sighs> the profile. Yeah, of any, of pretty much any, any kind of run of the mill, almost. That that middle section is instantly forgettable, but the back end is. I'm sorry, it's. I mean, I, I like the back window, but then I'd rather have seem a Porsche tail than this. Mm -hmm. I I oh. think like the Porsche tails are so much, so much better. And also, what's with the the charge door at the back? Um, oh, that's true. We've had this conversation again and again and again. Um, people don't like backing into spaces unless they're European. Um, in Europe, it's obviously very common Japan, to back too. into a parking space and Japan. Yeah. But in North America, you're going to pull in front ways. You're going to want that yeah. charging port on the front of the vehicle. All three of them have them in the back. Yeah, Ionic yeah. 5 and EV6 do as yeah. well. Yep. Yeah. Also on the C pillar here, that little that little cut in kick, it looks like Tesla, Tesla T to me. It does. <laughs> it does. Well spotted. <laughs> Can't unsee it now. I know. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's like a Mickey at Disneyland, except for it's the wrong company. So do you have a profile shot of it as well? Yeah, let me Simon? grab that for a second. That's the worst one. So I wanted to to do that slowly. Do you want to talk interior? Do you want me to, we'll, to get we'll there? We'll get there. Yeah. Okay. I just, I just want to see the. Let okay, me uh, so bring it no, down for a hot second so I can get more. No, pro no problem. And maybe actually, maybe I can share this other thing as well. Uh, I'm going to be completely honest, though. I've never really understood Genesis's target audience. Okay. Oh, oh well. I got that down. That Genesis is like the most premium looking vehicle for like not a very premium price. Exactly. We almost crashed That's into another point. car. Uh, but yeah, no, they're actually amazing. Like uh, we were driving. Uh, Timon was on. He's just not paying attention. And he's not on autopilot. <laughs> he's a terrible driver. Um, <laughs> no. So um, uh, the Genesis like GV80 carries such a presence going down the road. This thing looks exquisite. I drove the GV70 yesterday. Awesome vehicle. Um, this GV80 was coming down the road. I'm like in my smart car. I'm like, excuse me, let me get out of your way, sir. I'm so sorry for sharing the same bit of pavement. <laughs> and then here comes this bright green running shoe that's shaped like a jelly bean. How can this be any bit of what Genesis is trying to achieve? Clint, I really want, because you understand Genesis more than any of us, what in the world is going on and who approved this? They make such pretty cars. Every other car they've made in the last few years is stunning. And you know why? They know it's stunning. And they show these teaser images. They show the elegant lines of the car. And then they do these concept cars and design studies. And they're like, we know that our stuff looks great. It's some of, some of the best looking cars on the road. We didn't hear a damn thing about this car. <laughs> they left it in a barn somewhere. <laughs> And then saw a couple of spy shots where we thought like, oh, geez, you know, they'll show us the headlights and the taillights. It'll have all the usual Genesis stuff. And then I saw these images a couple hours before we went live with the story and literally was like, this, this isn't right, right? And both, oh, my God. I, I could go on. I don't mean to get like I, I all over the place here. I have a theory. And that is that Genesis is trying to kind of pull in the Gen Xs. And the millennials who are right. currently going for with that. The well, look, at, look at the vehicles. wheels. Look at the wheels. Yeah, they're pulling oh. in. No one. What are those wheels? Thing. Those are not. <laughs> those are not premium looking. Like no, no, they're Wolf. going for the. They're going for the sport more of a. This reminds me. If if you told me that this was a Velostar concept, <laughs> I'd be like, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> So if I'm going to get actually technical and do my job properly, there's no overhang. There's no front overhang. There's no rear overhang. Right. And the car is way worse off because of it. We started the show by talking about Ionic 5. Total knockout. Even the EV6, a little more avant-garde. Still a very attractive car from a lot of different angles. This has none of the charm that either of those two cars have. And this is supposed to be the expensive one. I kind of well, said the, the other day... So Go let's ahead. look at the interior then, because that's the expensive yeah, yeah. looking part. But if you debadge Ionic 5, EV6, and this car and stick them next to each other and show them to just your very average consumer, nobody would be able to tell that this is the premium car. Yeah. And, and you notice, before we get into the interior, they literally 
put the worst color they possibly could on it to show. I think a darker color might smooth out the ugliness a little bit. Like it, it just made it pop even more. Uh, you know, I, it's really shockingly, you know, un Genesis to me. It's, I, 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 I was hoping to put a halfway decent spin on it, but you can't. The thing, it just got beat with an ugly stick. It's terrible. <laughs> Yeah, it's got Tom, a boost button on. Hey, Tom, you have a lot of experience in luxury vehicles, of course. Um, you know, it, you and I both, and Clint. In what world is a bright green boost button on a steering wheel luxurious? Yes. I, I, the, e, e, it, even the inside, this, it looks like a step down from the Hyundai uh, Nexo. You know, it, it, exactly. you know it, does. It, it has Nexo kind of feel to it. It kind of looks like a mix between the new Ionic 5 and the Nexo. But like, not as nice as either one of them. Like they tried to take the sign language from both and make it premium, and they made it. They made both of them worse. Terrible. So the you know one, that, terrible. The you know those that, buttons on the steering wheel would work on a mini. <laughs> yeah, exactly. they would. Yeah. Let me get really close on those. You got boost and drive mode, which is kind of cool. I mean, they saved it a little bit. The interior quality is going to be a bit nicer. I, right. Dom, I know you wanted to specifically mention this. Or doohickey, is that right? <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll get to, yeah, I'm ready to Reminds go. Reminds me of Nomi on the Sorry, Neos. I didn't mean oh. to steal your thunder on no, that. That's all right. I, I well, wonder if that green button is color-coded to the exterior of the car. Like if it if you get whatever color your exterior is, because that is on this one. It ought to be, actually. Hey, uh -huh. so the, That's hilarious. The one, the one feature that the press release spent, uh, you know, most probably more time than anything else on that didn't, didn't really feature here, but there is a GIF, and I'll, I'll bring that up in a second. Yeah. Else. Uh, so it has a very funky gear selector called the Crystal Sphere. Uh, the orb. Right? So when the vehicle is powered up and ready to go, it flips around and becomes operational as a gear selector. And let me just show you what that looks like. Um, can you see that? No, you cannot. Uh, because I need to do this. I just want to know what happens when that thing breaks and it won't, and it doesn't <laughs> flip around. Right. You can't drive? <laughs> you know? Look at that. <laughs> oh, What? <laughs> right. See, no one's seen this. For some reason, this gift wasn't on the press release, but I no. Yeah, I'm really it. glad I, you found it. I want somebody to um, <laughs> to to basically put this on um, on R two D two in on in on the fighter. Right. <laughs> he's in the fighter and he's just about to go into right. battle, and and R two does this little you know. That's actually the Tesla bot waking up. <laughs> yeah. I don't know how to turn off the gift, but um, <laughs> just yeah. stop the screen. So screen. right. So that's kind of interesting, though. I guess well, like it's not happening when you're, you know, when you get in the car, uh, the the light it lights up. That thing provides a bit of a, a source of light, so you can see what's going on. And then as it kind of goes through its startup procedure, it flips around to let you know it's ready to go, and then you can you know spin it to the right into a drive. And it looks like there's also a drive mode function on the back end of it to adjust your different modes. Can we just can we just touch a second on the fact that? Um, you know, we've seen lots of innovation in the last couple of years when it comes to gear selectors. Tesla decides that you don't need a gear selector anymore. Right. <laughs> and its cars are smart enough to tell you which direction you want to go. Although, yes, you can press the button down on the center console of the of the plaids to get it to change. Ford comes along and goes, hmm, that big gear shifter is a bit of a pain. What would happen if we added a little motor so that it could fold down and you could turn your truck into a desk? Right. Really good. It almost feels like Genesis was in their design team meeting going, come on, guys, you've got to come up with something that's cooler than those two things. I like the idea of, uh, now that you've mentioned it, I can't get R2-D2 in, in the TIE Fighter <laughs> out of my head. <laughs> it looks, you know, that's basically what it looks like. Yeah. Um, man. So enough of enough of Genesis. So yeah, we're, we're deep into our time. And I wanted to hit really quick, though, a couple things. So Audi, Audi has announced... The company the knows how to design a car. <laughs> right. So Audi has uh, announced the introduction of the Performance S version of the Audi e-tron and Audi e-tron Sportback models in the US. So basically... Forbidden it's the, fruit, no longer. Right. Basically, it's the Audi e-tron we know and love, but with more power via two motors with torque vectoring in the rear and another on the front axle. So it's a tri-motor arrangement. Uh, so it also has less range, uh, but zero to 60 drops from 5.5 to 4.3 seconds, which is, you know, too far, you know, plenty. 
Plenty. Range goes from 222 miles to 208 miles in the regular e-tron and from 218 to 212 in the sport back, which is a little bit weird, those numbers. But it's not a it's not a really big penalty there. So, but Tom, MSRP is eighty four thousand eight hundred dollars or eighteen thousand three hundred dollars, about twenty seven percent more than a regular e-tron. Do you think customers will snap these up because of the extra power, or just because they're available for sale? I, I did a search last night on Cars.com and I saw forty new e-trons for sale in the entire country. <laughs> yeah, That's I not mean, many at all. Yeah. no, that- it's crazy. The manufacturers can't make cars right now. It's happening yeah. across the industry. I mean, you know, it's it doesn't mean that Audi's just not producing a lot of them because they don't want to. They just can't. Um, but so uh, the you, what you touched on, Dom, is what I was going to jump into um, was the prices they issued there. I, I mean, I think it's a great improvement. There's not a big range, uh, you know, penalty. You, you only lose a few miles mm-hmm. of range. And, you know, it really all depends how you drive the vehicle. You could probably end up getting just as much in a, in a regular e-tron if you just you know dr- drive it with the intention to get range um but that price is a huge problem now I, you know you always pay for a premium for the the high performance version of a vehicle but the e-trons are already on that edge of being a little too expensive and now you put this on top of it and you know i don't i don't see them selling a lot of them i i think it'll be a great car to drive i'd love you know the, to, to to even have one to be honest with you because they the, the e-trons drive great. I think they look great. I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the whole e-tron line. Mm-hmm. Even the Sportback line, I, I actually like how it looks. They tr- they're they like the best charging <laughs> EVs out there today. They, they do a lot of things right, but the the, the price and, and, and padding that price now with this extra um, is just a little – I think it's a little. It's going to push it out of reach, and it's going to literally push it out of reach of any state incentive because most state incentives – have um you know uh caps on the the price of the vehicle uh and uh so so this would just be uh you know in the realm of the federal tax credit now i don't think any state incentive um i, I could be wrong with that but i know the states that that i've done my that the, the deal of training and they would all be capped and and the vehicles would not qualify for any state incentives and that makes it even more expensive than a, a comparable car so yeah it's 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 a great. I think. I think it's great that 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 Audi did this. I, I think the vehicles are great, but they're not going to sell much in volume, in my opinion. So I agree with Marty Walsh, Walsh uh, who comments that the shortage allows them to release a car that costs a little more right now, and they're going to sell everyone they make just because people can't right buy now. A, there's just no yeah. cars for sale. Yeah, right now. Let's see how. Um, it, but this this shortage could last. I was reading something the chip shortage, which is hitting everybody, everybody's ability to. Uh, yeah. You know, is is going to last till like sometime next year. There was a dealer near me that had an e-tron Sportback that was um, like a, a dealership demo vehicle that had like six thousand miles on it, and they had it on the showroom for full MSRP. And and, oh. and, and you're not going to get this federal tax credit because it was registered by the dealership, so you're paying full MSRP and getting no federal tax credit. And they're like, Abby's already told us this is the last e-tron we're getting for at least four months, so. You know, if somebody wants one, wow. they're going to pay for it. It is crazy to see how how much this chip shortage is biting. But I think that what Audi's doing here is the same as what Tesla's been doing with its performance versions, is what everybody else is doing. Um, even Volkswagen has, you know, got rid of the, the entry-level version of the ID3 in Europe for the same reason. Car companies right now need to make as much money as they possibly can off every car they sell because they're making fewer cars because of the chip shortage. And that means right now, for well, for the foreseeable future, you're only buying an EV if you're absolutely loaded or very lucky. Mm-hmm. And that goes against everything that I hoped EVs would be. Right. And, and the used market is just as crazy. Kyle's mom just sold her Model Y. She hasn't had it that long. She made money on it right six Kyle? grand on her model y she made oh. four grand on her three before that and now she's driving to macon and she's happier look here's the deal uh can we talk about e-tron s for a second just really oh, yeah, just yeah. a second longer because you positioned it as it's like 14 grand more expensive the e-tron s only comes mid-spec and higher so premium plus or prestige so yeah you're really not that much more for a tri-motor significantly higher power level good looks and drifting capable five passenger <laughs> family suv think about this for a second evs are so weird this is like let me take the kids to school and shred up a track on the way home 
I mean, this is honestly for my needs, everything I do here in Colorado, it's the perfect car. It's everything I need in a vehicle. I like to go sideways. I want something comfortable with massaging seats and I have to do big distances. And this car is a stellar road trip vehicle. You cannot look at the numbers on this car and say, you know, oh, it's 208 miles of range, whatever it is, and you can't go anywhere. I've driven e-trons across the country. I get there faster than my Model 3 because it charges so freaking quick. This thing is a great car. Everyone who buys one, uh, is going, you know, totally against the grain. The Tesla people will never understand. This is a stellar vehicle. Oh, I, I just so I just had a thought just to move on from each one really quickly, but talk about another electric uh, uh, crossover SUV. Uh, Nikki, you had a video yesterday, last night, I think that went live. So you spotted the Mercedes EQC. Oh yeah, that's right. In in, in Portland. Yeah, I was actually sat at a uh, a place having um, a physically distanced lunch with some friends and an eqc pulled in it was wearing south carolina manufacturer plates and it had no camouflage on it whatsoever so it was right. definitely a ben's car based on the tail lights i think this was a u.s spec model because i didn't see any amber at all in the tail lights and so i think it's coming right oh that's cool yeah so mm. uh, tom's driven it uh, right, the EQC. a couple of times, yeah, yeah. The, I, I I really liked it. I mean, you know, it, it all, the price points a, a a big thing though. Like just kind of like going back to what I just said about the the e-tron. You know, it it, it has to make sense. You know, buyers are that are buying these cars are are typically first time electric vehicle buyers, and if if they're going into a Mercedes showroom and there's sort of a, a comparably equipped you know, internal combustion engine, Mercedes, you know, small crossover or a small compact SUV, that's 20,000 less than, than, than the EQC. It, you know, you it's, they're not going to move them. I mean, you're, yeah, you're going to get your enthusiasts, people that really understand EVs. I mean, you know, people like Kyle that really understand what the vehicle is capable of, but you know, that, that, that we're talking about very small numbers here. You know, we, we you know, the, I'm not interested in selling, you know, a thousand units a month or whatever of a vehicle we want. We want, mass you know mass market penetration and in order to do that there has to be some kind of relative price parity between the internal combustion engine vehicles and and, and the, the their electric counterparts and i think that's why mercedes initially didn't bring the vehicle over or one of the reasons at least not 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 the, the only reason um and it's the same reason why bmw i think didn't bring the ix3 to the us because they realized it would have to sell for so much more than a comparable uh, you know, internal combustion engine BMW that th their sales staff is just not going to be able to make the case when these things hit the sales floor. So I yeah. loved it. I drove it in, in Europe. Uh, I, I rode in it for about 40 or 50 miles here in the US out in Las, Las Vegas. Um, but I drove it in Europe and uh, I, I, I thought it was a, a great driving resource. Super quiet, incredibly quiet inside the vehicle. It had probably the best sound insulation of any EV that, that I've driven. It's not coming to the States. You don't think? No. So, I mean, so. from what I, they've told me, and they uh, they buried it in an automotive news story months ago, but Mercedes pretty much confirmed that uh, it, it's not coming here. And they've since kind of confirmed it to me, too. Okay. That's so, interesting because they said not at this time in the original. In the original. Uh, so, mail. in fairness, yeah. in like the last month or two, plans may have changed because of, you know, they can't even get V8s anymore. So, I don't know if they're going right. to try to bring over cars, but the, the sluggish sales in Europe, I think, uh, made that car something that was never going to come here. My theory is that that model might have had the 108 pack out of the EQS yeah, and maybe. that would make it applicable for US you know with its current with its stock 80 kilowatt hour battery pack there's no way that thing will sell because 200 miles is not enough unless you happen to live in New York City or you live in LA right. which let's face it will be its primary market but if you put 108 kilowatt hours in then um, I expect Kyle to road trip it across the country from my understanding within uh, my Mercedes contacts EQS will be the first car sold domestically Oh yeah, right. definitely. Oh, definitely. Right. But I think it will follow on from that. So uh, the thing is, so, can, the question is, can they build enough of, enough of them? Do they have enough battery supply or whatever? Can they build enough EQCs to sell over here and then also do launch in a new country? That's another huge expense. So do those things? Does it make financial sense? You know, holistically speaking. 
I don't think it will. I don't We're think moving on to more EQ cars sense. too. Right, and there's well, more. Well, EQA, EQV, uh, all the there's so many different letters coming up that'll be Q. By the way, EQS <laughs> yes. is uh, you know obviously the most tangible vehicle coming here. Yes. Clint, you and I both spent time with it. What a freaking stellar car in person. Yeah. Uh, you know, from an interior perspective, I'm not really sold on the exterior, but hatchback, super luxurious. You have all the the tech with that hyper screen. It's gonna be cool. I don't think we're allowed to publicly say yet, but in Munich in a couple of weeks, we'll be seeing a, another EQ car coming up as well. Mm -hmm. So there, oh. yeah, we'll uh, we'll get our first look at that. And so in just a couple of weeks here, we're going to be pressing forward with EQ to see uh, to see Clint, what's on the horizon. Will you be at the IAA this year? Yes. Oh, cool. cool. Well, we're all Tom, you, me. We're all going over there. We're all getting as long together. as we can get in and out of the country without it's a hitch, be a yeah. We're gonna have to have a podcast from from Germany. Yeah, right. Well, I have a hotel booked until the twentieth, so if we can't get out, we have a place to stay. Oh, that's <laughs> nice. Thanks. I'll write nice. that down. And Andre from Inside EVs is gonna be there also. Oh, yeah. awesome! So we're gonna have a full full team over there. The Romanian connection. Yeah, let's Go just uh, do it all from Germany. I agree with Dom. All right. Hey, so. I'd like to thank you, Nikki, for coming on the show today. And great, great to have you on as well, Clint. And thank you all for listening. I, I think that brings us to the end of our show, unless anyone has a par parting comment. Big thanks oh, yeah. to Nikki for coming on. That was awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Legend in the EV world. Really uh, awesome to have you on the show. I want you to know, Kyle, that my wife has been cheating on me with you right now. <laughs> Oh no! Now we oh, get wow. the bombshells let's, let's at the end Let's just say of the that show. because Wait, we're looking. Can I put for, that on my refrigerator and add that to my <laughs> resume? That's the best thing anyone's ever said. So, uh, because <laughs> because my wife is looking at an alternative to her bolt, um, we have been like doing research, and obviously she asks me what I think about cars, and she'll watch videos I've made because she doesn't watch my content regularly. I don't think anybody. <laughs> who lives with somebody like I'm sure none of right. your spouses right, watch right. any of your content but she's been watching my videos and then she's been watching other people's videos on cars too including yours so I've been joking with her that my wife's been cheating on me with other YouTubers so the best I'm, thing yeah. anyone's ever said to me I like that thank you I, yeah so actually Nikki I'm don't really let me curious. know anyone else is involved I don't want to hear about the other <laughs> <laughs> I'm really curious about you know your your next buying EV buying decision coming up. So you know there's a whole there's a plethora of new vehicles coming and out or out there, so, and you're probably going to be in the market for one soon. So I'm going to be watching your videos to see yeah watch that process. And I've said what two of them are going to be, but the third one is going to be uh, one of them is going to be a motorcycle replacement, which is an Aptera if it ever actually makes it to market. That's right, you're an Aptera um, order holder. F-150, because the business, we now have Ooh. a lot of camera gear we have to take places. Okay. Uh, the third car is going to stay um, quiet until we've actually signed on the dotted line. Well, I'll be interested well, to watch that. Will it stay quiet after you drive it away as well? Because it's electric. Of course. Of well, course. there you go. It's always quiet. <laughs> It'll be interesting to watch because I'm I'm wondering how that F-150 you know equation works out when with the other vehicles out there like the Rivian R1S and R1T. But uh but so you know follow nikki uh on youtube at transport evolve um so let's see that brings us to the end of our show uh if you have any questions or comments you can leave them on the inside evs forum podcast thread or on our youtube or twitch comment sections if you like the show please give us a thumbs up if you're watching on youtube or a rating if you're listening on another platform don't forget you can find and follow follow our panelists on twitter follow nikki gordon bloomfield at Transport Evolve, uh, Clint Simone is at Clint Simone, Tom Malogny is at Tom Malog, Kyle Connor is at It's Kyle Connor, and I'm at Dominic underscore Y. Uh, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications, and we'll see you all again next week. Ciao. Thanks. Thanks, guys.